Sure. You know, we're here to talk a little bit about your life arc. Was your was your family involved in law at all? Was that part of your work? Not at all. My uh, father was a naval officer, and then he uh, transferred over to becoming a, a leader in uh, what at the time was the largest trucking company in the United States. My mother, homemaker for a while, and then got into uh, working in nonprofits, uh, raising money for nonprofits. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what really got me into this whole field uh, started off, uh, I started off with kind of a human rights bent. I was 11 years old in Spokane, Washington, reading the Spokesman Chronicle and the Spokesman in Review every day and Newsweek and Time on the weekends. And the story that- you were 11 years old? 11 years old. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, we all, some of had these stories, you know, we're, I'm sure you were probably reading some interesting stuff too at that age. And, I think what took me was uh, or really um, impacted me was reading about the genocide in Cambodia in 1975. And maybe that was too young to be reading about that, but it really disturbed me. And I thought, you know, if, if my life's to have meaning, I would like it to, uh, I would like it to be centered on trying to stop such things. And to my mind in 1975, Spokane, Washington, I didn't know about the United Nations. I didn't know about nonprofits. I didn't know about the NGO world or space. I, even though I knew about journalism, I didn't quite understand its impact. But to my mind, the United States Army was the greatest human rights organization that ever existed. Mm -hmm. It freed a lot of people in uh, numerous wars. And it had the power to, at least in my mind back then, to stop an evil action taking place. So I think what put me on this path was the Canadian genocide, sorry, the Cambodian genocide and it's something I've tried to remember ever since. And I would say if there's a line of continuity in my life, it's the idea of trying to stop evil and free the oppressed. You ended up going to college at St. John's, right? Uh, for my second master's degree, yes. Second master's yeah. degree. So, so was Lou Carnesecca there? This is the most important question. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't remember the name. Oh, he was oh. a basketball coach at St. John's. Oh, yeah. sure. no, I, I, I totally missed him then. Yeah. It's just curious. Yeah. It's just <laughs> throw, throw away questions. Uh, and so, but you go to the military. You follow your dad. You go to the, the Navy, mm -hmm. right? Yep, yeah, indeed. And you uh, a JAG? He was not. He was a, uh, a service warfare officer, so yeah. just a Navy guy on ships at sea. But you, did you decide that you wanted to become a... Uh, I think I always wanted to be a soldier. Um, I think the Canadian, or, sorry, I keep saying the Canadian genocide. Oh my gosh, well, I've been talking to the Canadians all day today, but... Uh, they're all the camp, the place. I know, they, were, they couldn't swing a dead cat without hitting one. Yeah. They're wonderful. They've really uh, taken the leader, uh, leadership role in a lot of the things I'm working on. But uh, the Cambodian genocide, I think, put me in that direction. But I think I was still playing army when I was a young kid. And I think when it came time to decide what to do with my life, I applied to the Naval Academy, wasn't smart enough to get in, made it into West Point, and I think that was a good fit. I think uh, whether I knew it or not, I was built to be a soldier versus to be a sailor, and so I probably ended up at the right place. Go to the War College? Uh, later on, yeah, I graduated from West Point when I was a major. Uh, they sent me to the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you go to Carlisle? You know, I wouldn't have minded. I think uh, what I liked about the Naval Academy was um, uh, had a different curriculum. It was um, created to uh, take a look at strategy and policy with the whole idea that if your strategy does not meet your policy, your nation's no longer existing on Earth. And I thought that's a fascinating question for me. I think I saw a lot in the wars that I went to, Panama, Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, Kosovo, a few of the other things that I did in special forces and I had these burning questions and I took a look at the curriculum at the Naval War College and I'm like I can spend a year thinking about this whereas Carlisle had a different bent it was more geared towards uh, military operations and strategy hmm. so there was more of a uh, I think Carlisle wanted to get you to an end state to be a better lieutenant colonel and a better colonel the Naval War College I think was geared towards uh, thinking broadly about national security. What did your parents think when you became a ranger? I mean, now all of a sudden you you, you put yourself from the Navy into mm -hmm. a, a, a unit that kind of puts you in harm's way. 
Uh, my mom was none too pleased. I think um, uh, I've never really talked too much about it. Not that she, my mom is very talkative. It's not that we wouldn't talk about it. But I know during the invasion of Panama, I think I called her like two weeks after. And so we parachuted in on the night of the invasion and you know, spent a few weeks there. And then I, I think I waited until I got back to Savannah, Georgia after uh, like two or three weeks. And I called her and said, hey, mom, just checking in, just to let you know I was in that invasion. And, and she was like, I know, blah, 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 blah. So she was none too pleased, I think, with the combat side of the house. But I think overall she was um, happy about the military writ large. Mm -hmm. She felt that the military was a force of good and it was a good thing, an honorable thing to do. But I think even special forces probably gave her a little worry. But uh, I think my dad was probably a little more comfortable with it. Um, but for whatever reason, um, you know, why, why we do what we do, I just kept gravitating towards the Ranger Battalions and then Special Forces. And uh, I, I don't think I really could ever connect it to why in terms of my upbringing or my parents. <laughs> well, uh, you know, that's, that's a unique sector. And uh, when you are part of that, do you have a sense of where you may be assigned? I mean, is there... You're a ranger, you know, yeah. you say, gee, I hope I'm a ranger and I end up maybe at this particular hot, hot location. Not really. So the, uh, when you join the Army, let's say as an officer, uh, you're a second lieutenant, you have to go to a, a regular infantry unit. And I chose Fort Stewart, Georgia, the 24th Infantry Division, mechanized. And they had a ranger battalion. They have three ranger battalions. One's at uh, Savannah, Georgia. Another's at Fort uh, Benning, Georgia. Uh, they've changed the name of the post, I believe. And the other, another, the third one's in Fort Lewis, Washington. So there are three Ranger battalions, and I happened to be in Savannah in a mechanized unit. So when I transferred over from regular infantry to the Ranger infantry, you know, I was basically moving like 10 miles. Uh, so you don't really have a choice. Uh, it's a little different when you're just going to Ranger school and earning the Ranger tab, a two-month-long school. You know, that's a little different from them being assigned to different military units. But if you're going to the Ranger Battalions, you have three locations. And once you get there, all you do is soldier day and night. So it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty Spartan life. But uh, I think for me, it was a good fit. Did you think that not, that was an entryway at all through the military to get to a point where you were assisting in this international humanitarian world? Was that means to the end? I think it was a part of the journey and I think I was kind of conscious of that. I think uh, uh, I, I knew that I wanted to be in an organization that could free people and protect people. Uh, the Ranger Battalion to me was the tip of the spear, the cutting edge. You know, if we're going to war, the Rangers are going to be right there. And I thought, well, if I'm in the Army, that's where I want to be. And I think uh, in my mind, I would eventually gravitate towards special forces. And the motto of special forces is di oppresso liber, to free the oppressed. And so after serving as a first, first lieutenant in the Rangers, as a captain, I migrated over to special forces. And that might have been more in line with my thinking. Uh, I, I would say there's a, there's a stronger line of, commu line of continuity between who I was at age 11 and who I was at age 27 going into Special Forces because I was trying to free the oppressed and protect those who are more, most vulnerable. It's remarkable when you think about it. I mean, have you ever reflected on the fact that at a very young age, you started a path, perhaps consciously or unconsciously, that you have stayed on? I, it's funny, I thought about it only when I took this job and someone, I had to do just this, I had to, uh, uh, submit myself to an interview and someone asks tell me about your life story why are you doing what you're doing and in the it's almost like you figure out your narrative as you're talking about it but there's a conscious aspect of it to where at age 11 i knew i needed to go in the army for the reasons i explained and and once in the army special forces freeing the oppressed was a part of that and then getting out and then at that point you might lose a little more um, consciousness but when I left, I gravitated towards nonprofits. I ran an NGO in Somalia. I ran an NGO in Amman, uh, Jordan, and then eventually ended up in democracy, human rights, and labor at the U.S. Department of State. So, to my mind, I think my line has, or my life has, uh, had a lot of continuity. And whether it's been conscious or not, I seem to gravitate towards the jobs that uh, I think 
are geared towards protecting those that are most vulnerable. I'm going to fast forward because I, I you talk about free the oppressed, uh, Brittany Greer's. Oh yeah. And uh, you, uh, and I know this is probably usually at the end of the conversation, but let me get, let me just tie it in Please. with what you just said. Uh, how, in your role as at the time you were special presidential envoy for hostage affairs, mm -hmm. U.S. Department of State. Did you even know about it, let alone you were one of them that, that got engaged? So Brittany's case uh, uh, came to me rather quickly. She was arrested in Russia uh, under some, uh, I guess, some at the t at time ambiguous charges. And just to be very frank, within a short time, the Russians messaged us, uh, not by calling us on the phone or sending us an email, but they messaged that Britney was going to be used as diplomatic or political leverage against the United States. So that made it pretty easy. That case went from, you know, not mine to suddenly right on my desk, right before me. And then at that point, it was my job to try to work on negotiating her release and coming up with whatever the bargaining uh, chip would be that we would eventually offer uh, to, to return her to the United States. So we, I worked on Britney's case for quite some time, but at the same time, I was working on Trevor Reed's case which ended about the time we actually officially took Brittany Griner. And I'm still working on Paul Whelan. Now I'm working on Evan Gershkovich. Uh, all, all four cases coming out of Russia. But with Brittany's case, um, I think the Russians kind of helped uh, send that my direction rather quickly by kind of saying, look, we got this basketball star. We're going to squeeze you uh, on her. So you better get ready to bargain. And after that, we're off to the races. Um, the pleasure is in a very short time, I think nine months, we were able to come up with a release mechanism and I had the honor to represent the president by flying out to uh, Abu Dhabi and picking her up and trading her for the, the Russian that we decided to swap and, and I guess the rest is history. It was a fascinating uh, time to not only swap her but spend time on the plane getting a sense of what she went through. Can you talk about that? Sure. Okay. Um, I think when, uh, uh, when we swapped her, you know, it's, it was the second swap that I'd, I'd done with the Russians in a very short amount of time. And the first time we did it, it was in March of uh, 2022, it was with Trevor Reed. And in that case, we met in Istanbul and the Russian plane had arrived first. Our plane arrived second and we hadn't really talked out the logistics. But I figured, you know what, if Tom Hanks can do a bridge of spies, so can Roger Carston. So, the second our plane stopped, I said, everyone, stay on the plane. Let me go talk to my counterpart. And I ran down the gangplank and I ran and found my, my uh, counterpart, a, a Russian colonel from the uh, intelligence services. And I said, hey, look, here's the deal. Before we can sign the paperwork that releases um, Konstantin Yeroshenko over to you, I'm required to physically see the American, Trevor Reed. Let me suggest this to you. How about you let me jump on your plane I'll say hi to Trevor Reed, let him know who I am and how, what we're going to do. Then I'll take you over to my plane and you can see content sent in Yaroshenko. When you've seen him and you feel comfortable, you go back to my, your plane and then when you're there, we'll send our people back and they can walk and pass each other. You know, the American goes to the American plane, the, the Russian goes to the Russian plane. While that's taking place, you and I can stand out in the middle and just chat. And he said, sounds good. Well. Fast forward a few months later, we're doing the same thing with Brittany Griner. And again, the Russians beat us to the uh, transition spot. And we parked the U.S. plane and same thing. I said, everyone stay on the plane. I ran down. It was the same Russian. I said, hey, how are you? I said, hey, remember last time how I went into your plane first? You were kind enough to invite me onto your aircraft. He goes, yes, I do. I said, how about this time you come on my plane first? Why don't you come on my plane, see Victor Boot, make sure that you know you're happy with that. Then I'll go to your plane. I'll see Brittany Griner. That, that will allow me to give the thumbs up to sign the paperwork. And then just like the last time, we'll go back to our planes and then I'll send Victor Boot. You send Brittany Griner. They'll pass in the middle. And again, you and I can sit in the middle and just chat for a while. And that's how we did it. When Brittany got on the plane... Were escorts or just the two of them? Just, did it. just the two of them. I mean, the, the escorts that they had on the Russian plane were uh, FSB officers, some in uniform. About the the tarmac oh, walkway. I sent one of my guys over to Brittany's side to uh, because she had you know a few pieces of luggage. So I sent uh, my Russia case officer Fletcher Schoen. I'm like, hey Fletcher, 
could you go over and help Ms. Griner come back with her luggage? And the Russians did the same thing. They sent someone over to kind of escort him. Uh, but if you take a look at the video, it, it almost looks like if for some reason you seem to blank out everyone else and you just see Boot and Griner st almost stopping in the middle and then continuing on. But uh, yeah, when Brittany Griner got on the plane, uh, you know, I said, hey, Ms. Griner, uh, uh, there's your seat. I know you're probably going to want to collect your thoughts. The President of the United States will be calling in about five or ten minutes. But please, we'll give you some time to collect yourself. And she goes, nope. I'd like to see these people, if I may. She walked right past me and went and made eye contact with every member of the crew, saying, hey, I'm Brittany Griner. Who are you? Where do you come from? Thank you so much for coming to get me today. Hey, who are you? Where, where are you coming out of today? Really? I've, I've been there. Okay. Hey, again, thank you. She went and said hi to every one of the crew members. Then she goes and sits down. The president calls. She talks to the president of the United States for a few minutes. And then she hangs up the phone. I said, Ms. Griner, you probably want to relax and, again, get some time by yourself to think about all this. And she said, oh, no, I want to talk. I've been, I've been around Russian speakers for the last nine months. I want to talk English and tell my story. I'm, I'm ready to engage. And so, if really, for the next 17 hours, uh, most of it she spent uh, wide awake. And we talked about all sorts of things. And it was, uh, a lot of it was on her time in prison. But I found her to be, she's at 32 years old, and I, I tell you, I've met presidents of foreign countries, rock stars, um, war heroes, ambassadors. I honestly don't think I've ever met a more interesting and actually more self-aware person than 32-year-old Brittany Griner. She's an absolutely uh, amazing person. During the negotiation process, again, I'm... This is being taped, so you mm -hmm. can you, you'll use your discretion. Mm -hmm. um, is there like a pool of people? I mean, how does it start? Obviously, you know they want an exchange. Did they give you a list of people? You know what you want. Mm -hmm. One person, Brittany Gray. Did they give you a, we want three, two, four? Is, is that how that works? Uh, you know, yes and no. I mean, I think every negotiation is a little bit different. I think if specifically on the Russians, um, we started off not really sure what they wanted. I think we had some pretty good indications. I mean, I think I came to a conclusion very early, like a few years ago, that the Russians were going to do what they could to get Victor Boot and Konstantin Yurashenko back. And this was long before Brittany Griner was taken prisoner. Could, for the camera, could yeah, you sure. explain who those two people? Yeah, you bet. So um, uh, the Russians um, had two people. They had a few people in the U.S. prison system. I think you know roughly 15, 16, 17. And the two people that they wanted uh, the most, the two people that they were very interested in, one was Konstantin Yaroshenko, who had been charged with and uh, convicted and sentenced uh, for uh, the importation of drugs. Uh, he was a pilot. He spent a lot of his time in Africa, but he was involved in the drug trade. And uh, he was a DEA, the D uh, Drug Enforcement Agency, conducted a sting operation, got a hold of him, and he was sentenced to uh, many years in prison. Victor Boot was a guy who was nicknamed the Merchant of Death. He was an arms trader. He was uh, supposedly uh, uh, profiled in the movie Lord of War and played by Nicolas Cage. And he was responsible for selling anything from helicopters, uh, Kalashnikov rifles, RPG, rocket propelled, rock, rocket propelled grenade systems, uh, everywhere from, you know, mainly in Africa, but pretty much all over the world. And Victor was also convicted and sentenced to quite some time in prison. And for whatever reasons, the Russians wanted these guys. I think a lot of it has to do that they had ties to the uh, intelligence services. And in a way, the Russians don't leave a man behind. If one of their spies is taken, uh, it's my belief that they put some time and effort in trying to get their guys back. But I don't think we really knew right away what they wanted. And there was actually a suite of things, a bunch of things. We had a big laundry list. And it wasn't always just swaps. There were other things that I probably can't talk about uh, that had nothing to do about people-to-people -people exchanges that we, uh, in a way, test drove with the Russians. And after quite some time of back and forth with them, it became evident that they were they were very hard set on trading people and at that point we have to determine is that something we want to get into now every administration since for sure the 1960s has eventually conducted some sort of prisoner swap or a spy swap so starting in president kennedy going on forward every administration 
you know, says they don't want to do it, they're not going to do it, but every administration eventually conducts some sort of uh, swap-like activity. And I think what, what was important on this one is we tried to do the math, tried to really take a look at Yaroshenko and Boot to determine would they still be a risk to the United States? Would they return to a life of crime? You know, would, would, uh, if they, and if they return to a life of crime, would that harm our citizens, our country, the, uh, th those of our allies? Mm -hmm. And in taking a very hard look at them, and I didn't, it was the intelligence community that did, we came to the conclusion that um, uh, Victor Boot and Konstantin Yaroshenko would uh, not have any really strong residual risk to the United States, its citizens, or our allies. And so, I don't want to speak for the president, but shortly after that, uh, uh, that risk analysis was, was conducted, the president made the decision to trade Konstantin Yaroshenko, and then many months later, on a separate case for Brittany Griner, Victor Boot. So it comes to that high level. Mm -hmm. So the decision really comes from the top executive. I would say almost every uh, time I get a prisoner back, uh, and it's never just me, it's always this team effort. Yeah, yeah. But every time we get a prisoner back, the president of the United States usually has to render a decision of some sorts. Oh. Does that put on extraordinary pressure for you? I mean, in your position, you're obviously designated by the president. I mean, you mm -hmm. serve it as will. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, what you do uh, is, ex is, is pretty, pretty well exposed. I mean, you know, the press from the president. Oh, it is. Yeah. It is. It's, uh, not only are you working for senior leaders in the United States government, come on by. <laughs> not only are you working for senior leaders in the United States government, but um, uh, what you do is under a microscope. Uh, if I'm interviewed by CNN, if I say two or three wrong, wrong words, I'm fired. You know, because you, you might be going against U.S. policy. So, uh, not that it's ever happened, but you get the idea that whether you're doing the job or whether you're talking about doing the job afterwards, um, in a way, there is pressure, there is risk. Uh, there's also a little bit of pressure in dealing with the families. The families want their loved ones home, and I spend one to four hours every day talking to the families yeah. of those that are held overseas. I've actually talked to Paul Whelan, who calls from a Russian jail cell, saying, hey, when are you gonna get me out? So, um, they're, they're, they would say there are pressure points within the United States interagency. Uh, when you go to these big meetings to talk about how we're gonna do it, there's seldom initially a, a kumbaya moment. It's usually a lot of uh, strong debate about how we're going to get the job done. But eventually, over time, people come together and, and, and we come up with a solution. But the point being that um, the job has a lot of pressure attached to it. But I'd say, um, I think number one, uh, I've spent a life trying to be inoculated to stress. Um, I, I joke, and in a way it's the truth, but I've been to five wars. I've seen a little bit of combat, and yet the most combat I've ever seen has been wearing a suit and tie in Washington, D.C., yeah. trying to get anything done uh, in the government. But eventually, if you offer good arguments and are willing to put the time in, you're able to gain consensus, consensus in the United States government and push towards a decision st uh, state. So while there might be some pressure, uh, it's the price of entry. You know, if you, if you can't withstand that pressure, you have to move on and let someone else show up because that's just the nature of the job. It's whether it's the families, the prisoners, the interagency within Washington, D.C., talking to the other side like the Russians. Um, you have to be able to withstand a little heat. And uh, the one thing I can say is that uh, I have a good team. The interagency, CIA, Department of Defense, Department of Treasury, Department of Justice, that's a good team. The families have been supportive. And so while there are effort or instances where the pressure can start to mount up a little bit, I'm never taking it on my own. And to be honest, I mean, we all have different mechanisms. Some people work out, some people read. Um, you know, we all deal with pressure in different ways. And I spend a lot of time praying. You know, I figure, uh, you know, I'm not smart enough to get this job done on my own. So I have a good team, spend a little time talking to God, and I push forward. How much is it important to have had the discipline that the military gives anyone in a public sector job, certainly which one which has a stress level to it? I think it's been helpful. I mean, uh, the, uh, I've seen so many people that never spent time in the military. Uh, lawyers, for example. 
Um, you're not shrinking violets. The, and if you're in the legal field, you have to have your ducks in a row. You know, you're, you're, you might be defending someone's lives or prosecuting someone who's a murderer. So there's a lot of weight. There's a lot of heavy pressure. And so uh, I don't think the military has the corner on dealing with pressure and being, um, as they say, squared away. But I know with me it helped. Um, definitely on terms of the pressure. I mean, you can at times be um, under, under the gun from a news agency or a family or someone in the government. And I have to compare that to my time in the military. Well, at least no one's trying to kill me right now. Right. So you know, I kind of weigh that. I'm like, ah, okay, I think I can take this phone call and take the heat. Um, and I think the military is good for in, in terms of, um, uh, I guess, organizing yourself. But here's where it's really helped. I think the military has been good because when I took this organization over, I was the fourth person and nothing was really institutionalized yet. And I was able to go back to my time in the army and think that when you build an organization, you do so with what's called DOT MLPF. That's an acronym for doctrine, organization, manpower, facilities, funding, etc. There's a way that you build an organization and once you build it, there's a way that you employ it. And in the military, those are the war fighting functions. And so I think I was able to sit down with my chief of staff, Carol Lee Walker, and come up with a battle plan about how to grow and institu institutionalize the organization to where we weren't always just you know, making it up as we go along. We had a budget, we have ways of doing business. We know who to talk to at the Department of Justice. We know how to get things done within the State Department. Uh, we can manage or create processes to work with Congress, to work with the media, to work with the civilian uh, sector. And over time, we've been able to do that. And I think a lot of that came from uh, being in military organizations that in a way rate themselves on how well they're building out that dot MLPF and how well they're employing what it is that they're supposed to do. Did you, I mean, we're, we're kind of where you are today. In order to get the life art there, I mean, you're in a, you're in a kind of a hostage affairs. Mm -hmm. But throughout that, you've been in Jordan. You've been the Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, which are pretty general. And it's a general mm -hmm. category, if yeah. you will. Now all of a sudden, you're really fine. fine. Great observation. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, this is... Um, you know, I, I use this during lunch. I mean, there's an artillery burst, which is wide, and then there's a sniper shot. Um, a lot of things I've done have been artillery in nature, very wide and broad. Uh, human rights uh, issues at the State Department are broad. Uh, I think this is very laser focused. Um, in a way, there's a goodness about that. There are things I don't worry about because I have one mission, like a, like a dog with a bone. I've got to find a way to get people home. Um, and it allows me to not worry about some of the things that I would have worried about at, and when I was doing human rights. On the flip side, there's a cost to that. There are decisions that I've made or decisions that I've offered senior leaders that I wish could account for some more of the human rights or the justice or accountability portion. But uh, really, uh, and I'm sure you were the same in, in your law uh, field. Um, you're given a mission and sometimes that mission's broad human rights. Sometimes that mission is very focused, hostages. And right now my job is to pursue that, uh, I'd almost say ruthlessly, but I think the way we try to pursue it is done in a way that builds teams. So we, while we may, and I think the visual and the perspective on the outside is we're ruthlessly pursuing our objectives. But if you're inside the uh, system and you're working with us, it's, it's a team effort and it's very collegial. Hostages, obviously, by definition, is that somebody's grabbed one of our own yeah. and has them under control. Do you ever get to a point where you see a hot spot and there's always travel advisories saying, oh, yeah. get out of Dodge, we've got intelligence because yep. things are happening. To yes. avoid the hostage, are you part of that too? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I do the analysis. Yeah. Uh, a lot of it's common sense, though. You know, something's going on. I mean, you and I are men of the world. You know, oh, yep. Probably shouldn't go there. But the State Department actually does the analysis. The CIA will do the analysis. And as it's all coalesced, at least in the State Department, we'll put out travel indicators. Uh, for us, there's, there is one for becoming a hostage, being taken by a, a terrorist group. But there's another one 
warning Americans not to go to a country mm -hmm. that will essentially make someone a hostage. We call that a wrongful detention. And so where there are six countries in the world right now that have what's called the D indicator, the detention indicator. So we're trying to warn people, but you know, not everyone goes to travel.state.gov before they go traveling. And uh, there are a lot of people that like to explore. We have a travel uh, person who wanted to go to every country on earth, uh, made it to 196 of 197, and Syria decided to throw him in jail. Because why? He was in Syria. Who's this American in Syria? But also, you know, there are a lot of journalists that uh, are Americans, and we actually expect them to go to dangerous places and report. That's what they do. Then they're humanitarians. Um, people like Brenda Hollis. She's on the front line of the, uh, of the war in Ukraine. Um, in a way, that wouldn't be rational for most people, but she's a human rights lawyer, so she's right where she should be. And so we have cases where a journalist doing his job in Russia is taken by the Russians. We gotta solve that. We have other cases where we've had a humanitarian, uh, or in, I think one case, I could think of a person who um, worked for a Christian NGO uh, taken in Mali and held for six and a half years. So sometimes the Americans uh, uh, might, you might question their judgment in going into a certain place. Other times, in a way, it's what they must do as a journalist or a, an NGO uh, member. But regardless, if the Secretary of the State de determines that they're wrongfully detained, that person falls on my desk and we pursue. To provide security, so if they say, here's somebody that likely will be detained uh, and is put into a location yeah. for strategic reasons, perhaps, do you provide security? You know, we don't. Um, if it's done through the government, like I've gone places and uh, I've had a security detail forced upon me. I think if you're in an NGO, they usually take care of it. A nonprofit uh, at times will hire security. Reporters certainly do. Not every reporter, but if you go to like an NBC camera crew, they'll usually have three or four people that are professional security people following the crew through a war zone. But we, we don't force that, we might advise that, but at the end of the day, if it's an American citizen and not a member of the US federal government or the government, um, then in a way, we can caution them, we can advise them, but we don't provide any of that security for them. Having said that though, um, the safety and security of Americans, is that's really the most important job of the US government, especially the State Department. So when a citizen goes to a place like, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example, Russia, we want to know that our citizen's there. So please tell the embassy so we can try to track you. Here's a phone number. If you have problems, call us. You actually shouldn't be here right now. Watch out for this. If you feel you need to be here for business reasons, we would advise that you don't do A, B, and C. So we try to proactively uh, work to prevent things from happening, but they're not actually, uh, it doesn't go to the extent of providing security. <laughs> Hard to look at a crystal ball. I mean, you've had so many fascinating you know, positions and job career activities, but where do you see yourself in about five years? Boy, my wife asks me that all the time. Uh, I really don't know. I think when I was a uh, captain in the army, I was trying to get into a, a special military unit and I had my plan already built out and as I got closer it just suddenly went in the other direction and I think as a major I tried to do the same thing. I plotted my, my milestones and objectives out and suddenly I was going in the wrong direction and it, it just occurred to me one day that the more I plan and plot and scheme the more God's probably going to smile and say no that's not what I want you to do. So what's my plan right now? I have no plan. I figure when it's time for me to go, God will open the door and push me out. And then hopefully he'll open up another one that I'm supposed to walk through. As a special presidential envoy, you are at the will of the president. So I am. if the winds of political change change, you, your job isn't one of those three year, five year contract Correct. jobs. It's, I'm gone. You're gone. You're at yeah. will. I am. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, and, and I'm, I'm obviously very fine with that. Uh, I was um, very grateful that uh, after President Trump appointed me to this position, that President Biden asked me to stay on. And it's, uh, I think, not necessarily, it does not necessarily say anything about me, I think. It speaks to the office. Our office is really bipartisan. It's nonpartisan. Uh, we enjoy support from Republicans and Democrats on Capitol Hill. We address an American problem, not a Democrat or Republican problem. 
And so even though I'm a political appointee, I think I'm, to be honest, I think I'm the lone surviving Republican appointee in the Biden administration. Uh, every day I go to work and I'm proud to serve this president in this role. And every day I go to work and we, we just don't, we throw politics aside and we just get after the work of the president and get after the work of the United States by bringing our citizens home. Uh, and even having said that though, the next president could come in and say, I want my person in that role. And I'm like, well, of course you do. And I'll thank the president for the uh, opportunity to, to have served him, him or her, should a Republican ask me to go. And I'll move out and, and try something else. Who do, you, who do you report to? The Secretary of State. So okay. it's an interesting job. I'm appointed by the president, but I report to the Secretary of State. Uh -huh. And I think with all the um, equities, if you could call it that, uh, involved in the work that I do, it's probably a pretty good place for it. Uh, when we have a, a citizen that's taken in Iran, for example, or Venezuela, I find myself working with members of the State Department regional teams to, to come up with a strategy to push forward. What do you think about this? What's here? We have been back here since 2009. Here it is 2023. You're at Chautauqua and the 15th International Humanitarian Law Roundtable uh, principal speaker. And, you know, you have kind of, kind of a different role than you were many moons ago. Indeed. And uh, what's your sense of this all? With that? I think it's, uh, it, I feel like I'm getting more than I gave. Um, I came here with a specific uh, objective in mind and that I wanted to try to entice the brightest legal minds on earth to help us work on establishing norms against hostage taking and creating wrongful detentions and also to work on the idea of deterrence. How in the next 10 or 15 years can we create a deterrence strategy that involves not only the creation of norms, but also the creation of a multilateral effort to stop this, this scourge. And I think I'm in the right place to do that. If I can get these people to spend some time thinking about it, um, I think my time up here will have definitely been very much worth it. And I already know it has been. I've had probably um, five or six conversations in the last five or six hours alone that have just left me speechless. Uh, you know, I, I had a chance to talk, give a speech and afterwards a gentleman came up and spent 10 minutes with me and as he was talking, I kept writing down what he was saying. Uh, and I'm going to go take that back to DC and try to work with that. But better yet, he gave me his card and said, I'm, with the, I'm at the University of Virginia. My students would love to jump into this. Can we work together? And I'm like, that's exactly what I was trying to do. Sure. But, but aside from that, uh, I'm blessed. I'm, I'm, I'm truly here with some of the greatest legal minds that this, this world's ever produced. And I have a chance to learn from them. I have a chance to actually have just casual, fun, friendly conversations. Um, it's, I, it's one of those ones where you kind of pinch yourself and, and say, I can't believe I have the honor and privilege of being here. So uh, this has been great. Uh, I can't wait for this evening. I imagine over a glass of wine, I'll have a chance to meet a few more people and garner some of their ideas. But I'm grateful that David Crane, who's been a good, long, close friend of mine for 15 years, uh, I'm glad he invited me. And it was also good to reconnect with friends like uh, Professor uh, Newton mm -hmm. and a few others. So uh, I'm grateful. This has been a good time. It's actually not a good time. It's been an impactful time right. for me and what I do. Well, it's an impactful for us to have you here. And I really appreciate this. I was really looking forward to this moment mm -hmm. to have to sit down and talk to you. Well, you know, when I, when I was introduced to you yesterday by David Crane uh, at your center, uh, first off, I was um, deeply impressed. Um, it, I, I wasn't sure what to expect uh, when we uh, went to the dinner last night. Uh, and walking around and looking at the former awardees or going down to the uh, dining hall where we had a chance to see those, as you said, I, I guess the, the sketchings, the lithographs okay. of, of, those, uh, of those who committed the war crimes. And to hear you talk about why you actually set up that display, uh, you know, you are doing deep and impactful work and I was grateful to have a chance to hear from you about your work and to look at that beautiful center. So it's, it was an honor and pleasure to uh, have that experience last night. I was grateful to share that with you. One of the things we had at the center, we're, 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 by and by, uh, we, I found, because the, the one, the second seat 
mm. in the prosecution of Colonel Abel, mm. which was part of the Bridges Spies. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's alive. That's right. He's alive. The case was tried mm. in 57. Mm. He came to the center. And also, his, the number one seat to actually try Abel, Colonel Abel, is James Donovan. James Donovan mm. was the right hand guy for Robert Jackson. I'll be darned. So you start wow. connecting all these dots, <laughs> and we had this guy, and it was, and, and we talked mm. about spies, and you know, other British spies, and how that all played out in, in mm. actuality, but also the fact we have several guys from the Department of Justice, from the FBI and others, yeah. who came down and talked about other cells that were going on. It was a darnest. That's story. fascinating. Program, but yeah. I love touching the hem of, you know, the Anthony Palermo is his name. Terrific guy. Mm. I digress, and I know you probably need a glass of wine, but thank you very much. This was great. It's funny. I enjoyed, um, sometimes I don't enjoy being interviewed. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. You chose a great venue. This is wonderful. You asked some great questions, so thank you. Thank you. Thank All you. right.